Welcome everyone. Um, today we have Michelle Steffler. She's going to be presenting on Famous Art Explained. Michelle is primarily a pencil artist and painter of dogs and wildlife, but can sew crazy quilts that will make your head spin. She holds an associates in display and exhibit design from New York's Fashion Institute of Technology, a bachelor's in visual arts from the State University of New York, and a master's in art education from Adelphi University. She's the illustrator of the children's book titled, It's Okay, You Can Talk to God, written by Lillian Newells. From 2010 to 2014, she served as the president of the Pug Rescue of Austin and devotes most of her free time volunteering with Texas Humane Heroes Animal Shelter and donating for We Are Blood Bank. She has been a member of the Round Rock ISD Visual Art Faculty since 2009. Welcome, Michelle. Thank you, Ms. McDowell. Thank you for, for inviting me tonight. This is an art museum in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Look at how the art is displayed as to completely immerse the gallery space and confront the patron. Just like this museum in Brazil, I hope that tonight's lecture will give you a fresh new perspective on art. So you might be asking yourself, what makes art significant? Tonight, you will be introduced to several art masterpieces completed over the last few centuries by artists who were visually expressing emotions and were courageous enough to share them with the world. See, art is deeply personal, often ridiculed, and definitely misunderstood. Some of these artists craved approval and acceptance their entire lives, only to be recognized posthumously. You'll notice that some themes and struggles repeat themselves. Artists can become obsessed with and consumed by the artwork itself. So we start in the Sistine Chapel. This is a painted fresco ceiling in Rome's Sistine Chapel completed over four years by Michelangelo, a Florentine painter, sculptor, and architect during the High Renaissance, which is a period of rebirth in which philosophy and literature and art and sciences drew on ancient knowledge from classical antiquity. Between 1508 and 1512, under the patronage of Pope Julius II, Michelangelo tirelessly worked standing up on a wooden scaffold with his head tilted back, living lifelong vision and back problems. The separation of light and darkness is the first of nine central panels that run along the center of Michelangelo's ceiling and it depicts scenes from the book of Genesis. 300 preliminary drawings have been found that were made during the planning stages. These scenes display the artist's total belief in and commitment to the project. In this case, to produce artwork that is worthy of God himself, housed in the papal chapel where the next Pope is elected and where they perform mass. This Sistine Chapel's dimensions are exact to the Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, Israel, which was destroyed in 70 AD. This next piece is also by Michelangelo. It's a marble statue that was carved between 1501 and 1504. This artwork that can be from this seen from this time period is featuring the Christian humanist ideal, which can be seen on this David statue, visible in his posture, features like the young David's furrowed brow. See, David was a shepherd boy, and he's showing natural trepidation for fighting against a giant with only a slingshot in hand. The unarmored David slays Goliath. Most artists during this time depicted a triumphant David after the fight, but Michelangelo portrayed David right beforehand. This is his original sculpture housed inside the popular Uffizi Museum in Florence, Italy. But right outside, there's a large scale replica in the town Piazza. Back inside the Sistine Chapel on one of those panels that I just talked about, 
there's more evidence for man being the measure of all things and the humanist ideal in this creation of Adam, represented as God and Adam reach for each other with their arms outstretched. God is the older man with the gray flowing hair who desperately tries to connect with an intentionally inanimate Adam. Soon he will transform physically and spiritually after God bestows life. Michelangelo pushed all boundaries and created his artistic vision by painting deceptively natural and simple scenes with extreme realism. This entire ceiling was restored, not without some controversy in the 1980s, and it took almost 12 solid years to remove centuries of grime and pollution. Some theorists think the scene contains the unmistakable outline of a human brain formed by angels, puti, cherubs, and robes surrounding God and continue to assert intelligence is God's gift to man. Let's try to understand this. Michelangelo had many opportunities to dissect and explore cadavers in his late teens while serving as an art apprentice. During this time, there was great curiosity about the human body and anatomy. However, religion was a central part of the Italian culture and was forbidden to study the body. See, the body was seen as sinful and the cause of temptation. In the Old Testament, Adam and Eve eat the apple from the tree of knowledge, realize their nakedness, and soon cover themselves with shame. Due to the nudity in this important story, Christians associated nudity with sin and the fall of mankind. 20 years later, Michelangelo returns to complete this wall entitled The Last Judgment. It was painted from 1536 to 1541, and it covers the entire altar wall. Below Christ, which is centered here, is the separation of the blessed and the damned. Dramatic and powerful depiction of the end of time. God is a powerful judge, Virgin Mary, next to Jesus Christ. See, it's been centuries since Christ was depicted without a beard. It was suggested the body of Christ should have been much larger than those of the saints and the souls surrounding him. On the left side, you have the blessed. They're being lifted up to ascend on rosary beads and by muscular arms. Scenes of martyrs, long golden trumpets from the book of Revelations. The angels are male, very muscular and loud, waking the dead to emerge the spirits from earth. The body is dense and moves with great difficulty. On the right side, the damned are being delivered by boat. There are demons harvesting souls. There is a person referred to right here where I'm pointing as the damned man, as his expression convincingly includes both the disbelief and the realization that he will go to hell forever. Michelangelo decided not to depict hell itself and to leave it to our imagination. We move on to the Dutch artist, Johannes Vermeer, painted the girl with a pearl earring in 1665. It's a collection of the Merit House or Matthew House in the Hague Museum since 1902. It's an example of a trony, which is Dutch for face and French for the word mug. Popular in the Dutch golden age, 
these tronies were paintings that focused on the face of the subject with an added element of fantasy or exaggeration. Use of props, especially hats. The expression differentiates them from commissioned portraits. They were essentially anonymous models doing next to nothing other than posing. She is highly recognizable now and it is said to be the Mona Lisa of the Netherlands because of the innumerable crowds she draws from The Hague. Not much is known about this model. Some mysteries remain and everyone can speculate about her. She most likely sat for Vermeer in his studio and he studied her expressions, but didn't idealize her. Viewers are free to have their own personal interpretation of the girl. She may have been a maid or a nanny to Vermeer's 11 children, or perhaps one of his daughters who borrowed one of her mom's pearl earrings. Some say the title is actually a misnomer. And a pearl earring of that size would have been tremendously heavy. It's more likely concave hammer tin. During this time, the Dutch had a thriving trade in global goods. Vermeer was likely to be able to purchase paints from abroad. Researchers have determined on this painting that the white lead paint was shipped from Northern England and was more valuable than gold during that day. Vermeer paints using this ultramarine blue semi-precious stone from Lapis Lazuli, which is modern day Afghanistan. The red that was used was made from bugs that were native to South America and Mexico. Interestingly, Vermeer has only 35 paintings accredited to him. Girl with the pearl earring being the most recognizable piece. Ah, uh, the great wave Akanagawa is a woodblock print by the Japanese Yukioi artist Hakusai. It was published around 1830 in the late Edu period. As the first print in Hakusai series, 36 views of Mount Fuji. Edo is a time period, but also a place which is current day Tokyo. This print is one of the most reproduced and instantly recognize artworks in the world. The mountain with a snow capped peak is Mount Fuji, which in Japan is considered sacred and a symbol of national identity and natural beauty. The image shows a large rogue wave threatening these three boats off the coast of the town of Kanagawa as tiny Mount Fuji watches in the background, symbolizing the irresistible force of nature and the weakness of human beings. Hakusai began painting when he was six years old. And at 16, he was apprenticed as an engraver and spent three years learning the trade under one of the most foremost Yukioi artists of the time where he became extremely popular. By the age of 70, he had produced thousands of pieces and became the author of the woodblock print series, 36 Views of Mount Fiji. Hakusai gained fame both in Japan and worldwide. Over his career, Hakusai used more than 30 different names. Here is his, his signature on the upper left always beginning a new cycle of work by changing it and letting his students use the previous name. Some say this piece represents the difficulties he faced towards the end of his life. His grandson forced him to enter poverty by gambling away all of Hakusai's money. Hakusai also struggled with the grief he felt for his wife who had passed away. Here is a step-by-step -step process of the Japanese woodblock printing. 
starting from the upper left, follow the black arrows. Hakusai would take his final sketch to a harishi or a block carver. He glues the thin washi paper to a block of wood, usually cherry wood, and then carefully and slowly carves it away to form a relief of the lines of the image. In the process, the drawing is lost. Finally, with all the necessary blocks, which is usually one for each color, a surishi or printer places the printing paper on each block consecutively and rubs the back with a hand tool known as a baron. There could be a great number of impressions produced, sometimes thousands, before the wood block were out. We move now to America. This American folk painter, Edward Hicks, painted this version of Peaceable Kingdom in 1834. He was a steadfast and proud member of Society of Friends, which is also known as the Quakers. This painting describes a biblical verse from Isaiah 11. It depicts Advent season. He's to come over Christmas as infant Jesus in the upper right where I'm pointing enters the world and offers salvation. Most of these paintings are asymmetrically balanced to reflect actions taking place between groups of people and animals within his work. There is a carriage painter an ornamental painter by trade, Hicks' steady hand was ideal for small lettering and quoting passages within his paintings. Hicks almost always painted outdoor scenes in which the light source is the sun or the sky. He became extremely faithful to his religion and was married with five children to support. He wrote an autobiography in 1851, he struggled financially, he wrote in the book, but he also struggled to align his artistic and creative impulses in a faith that frankly discouraged creativity. Several seasons converge into one hopeful scene using what artists use something called atmospheric perspective, which I'm pointing out here. Atmospheric perspective is when an artist uses darker colors in the foreground and lighter, usually cooler colors with a lot less detail in the background to increase the illusion of depth. There's 14 animals looking alert, yet serene, being directed by children. On the upper right hand corner, you have child. Jesus Christ leading a lioness. Jesus Christ is born to reconcile all creation to God. Quakers believe that there is a direct relationship between God and each believer. Every human being contains something of God. This is often called the light of God. So Quakers regard all human beings as equal and equally worthy of respect. Quakers accept that all human beings contain goodness and truth. Quakers don't do dogma. The closest thing to a firm belief is pacifism. So this background depicts a treaty negotiation happening in 1737. See, you have the native Lenope, which was not, um, not modern day Delaware area, the native Lenope tribe, it agreed to sell all the land that one man could walk in a day and a half to historical Americans like William Penn. Penn hired a team of skilled runners to complete the walk on a prepared trail. So essentially they cheat. The colonial government under Penn measured out a track much larger than the Lenope tribe had originally intended to sell, roughly 1,200 square miles. Hicks depicts imperfection at human attempts 
at peace. This version, one of 62 similar paintings, is now housed at the National Gallery of Art. The title of this next painting is here. It's in French. It's a little hard to read. In English, the title is Where Do We Come From? What Are We? And Where Are We Going? It's painted by French Impressionist artist Paul Gauguin in 1897. It's located in the Fine Art Museum of Boston, which ironically, Gauguin traveled all around, but never to the United States. Gauguin was a complicated artist who was in absolute despair when he undertook this painting in 1897. Mourning the death of his estranged daughter earlier in the year and oppressed by debts, he used every penny and cashed in every favor to purchase oil paint. In fact, he used gunny sacks or burlap sacks sewn together for this giant mural. Representative of his post-impressionistic style, you see thick brush strokes, vivid, saturated, colorful, bold, and very unapologetic. It's supposed to be read right to left, and I'll walk you through it. The dog representing Paul Gauguin himself, the artist. The nearby baby signifies the beginning of life. The figure whose back is turned to the viewer could be understood as the beginning of one's individual realization of gender, a symbol of life and innocence, surrounded by three Tahitian women. At the center of this composition, there's an androgynous figure reaching for an apple from the tree of life, which symbolizes temptation. Gauguin pointed at primitivism, mystery and innocence, an idol here. Its hands mysteriously raised seems to indicate the beyond. Those are his words. Lastly, an old woman holding her head nearing death appears to accept everything. The mood, the deep dark blue tones, the emotion and high contrast make for a masterpiece. Let's back up and analyze Gauguin. He's got a some story. After graduating from Naval Prep School, he drifted into finance and became a stockbroker before the age of 20 making a huge salary, lost everything when the stock market crashed in 1882. He decided to pursue, pursue art as a career, and he married a Dutch woman who bore him five children. However, his forever roaming eye and fantasies of travel made fidelity complicated, and in 1885, he abandoned it all. He was not religious, but very spiritual. And in his letters to friends back in Paris, he compares himself to martyrs, rift with torment and heightened romanticism, which led to what I like to call fantastical fibs. We have letters from his network of artist circles, including Degas, Cezanne, Pizarro, and he was a brief roommate of Vincent van Gogh. With the nudging and the bribery of Van Gogh's brother, Theo, Paul Gauguin roomed with Vincent Van Gogh in Arles, France for two months. Although complete and total opposites, they had a shared interest in sculpture, woodcuts, explorative use of vibrant colors as symbols, and to express emotion. They fought. Van Gogh sliced off a bit of his ear, and Gauguin took off from Arles to sail to Tahiti in 1891 in search of earthly paradise and simplicity, leaving it all behind. When he arrived, he was horrified by the French colonialism in the French Polynesian islands and was drawn to the mountainside to a simple native culture and religion. Well, 
There, he convinced a native Tahitian family to allow him to marry their 13 year old daughter and left her a few years later, along with their small child, to marry two more times. After island hopping, he eventually settled in a grass hut, which he nicknamed, and this is a polite translation, the hut of pleasure. Gauguin died destitute with painful syphilis sores ravaging his body, suffering the effects from years of alcohol abuse, failing eyesight, and a never healed broken leg. And he died on the Marquis Islands, which is where he's buried today. Because of his Parisian art dealer who marketed Gauguin's tropical island scenes like this one, when erotic exoticism was fetishized, he is now recognized posthumously as an artist renegade who chose the Bohemian lifestyle. Pretty interesting. Another American we talked about, we are going to talk about is, was this painting was painted in the 1930s and it's an oft parodied American Gothic is the title. It was created by artist, Midwesterner, camouflage artist, stained glass muralist named Grant Wood. This style is called American regionalism, usually tethered to scenes of America's Midwest landscapes, propagating the prevailing American spirit of resilience, living in a productive, industrious, and moralistic lifestyle, which I think he nails. The figures are actually a father and daughter. Most people immediately think that it's a husband and wife. And you'll notice immediately there's some gender stereotyping I'll point out to you. Well, the woman is closer to the house and she's in an apron. The man is holding a pitchfork and she's behind the man. Dad is stern probably Christian and stands for very traditional values. The daughter is a spinster, unmarried, stares into the distance, not at the viewer. Perhaps she yearns for more in her future. Let's go back and talk here about the architecture. So this is a real home. It's in Iowa and it's now a museum. Um, the architecture here is called Greek Revival, also called Carpenter Gothic. So this is different than the Gothic stone, the Gothic architecture that was in Europe. This is Carpenter Gothic, which is using wood. Grant Wood, <laughs> incidentally, his name is Grant Wood, studied in Europe, and he made four trips there in a span of four years. So. It's funny, he used, uh, Grant he painted his sister, Nan, to be one of the model for the woman, and his dentist, probably the only dentist in town, uh, pictured here, uh, as the model for the man. And it's pretty spot on. So, the patterns that are in the woman's aprons, well, they repeat. It's not accidental. They repeat here in the curtain. The pitchfork that the man is holding is also duplicated in the overalls. In the back, you have these round amorphous trees. Well, Grant Wood did paint like that. And you, you see him using atmospheric perspective, which again means darker in the front, lighter, usually cooler, in this case, blue in the back. So that to add space, to add depth, this painting was painted by Wood when he was 40 years old. He won $300 from the Art Institute of Chicago, where it is still now displayed and in part of their permanent collection. They were holding a, a sort of a contest and he won. Grant taught at the University of Iowa until allegations of him being gay surfaced simultaneously with news of a cancer diagnosis and left his position at the college. 
He dies before he turns 51 of pancreatic cancer. Ah, this one is meaty. Guernica is a painting by Pablo Picasso. He's a Spanish national who lived most of his life in Paris, France. When this was painted, Picasso was mid-career, middle-aged, and extremely famous throughout the world with a bold and salacious reputation. Guernica depicts suffering, people, animals, and buildings that are wrenched by violence and chaos. Let me explain. This was inspired by shock, grief, and horror at the Nazi German bombing of Guernica, Spain in 1937 during the Spanish Civil War. It was a surprise attack. Picasso was horrified. After the bombing, he was commissioned to create this huge mural for display at the 1937 World's Fair in Paris. The mural represents a scene of death, violence, brutality, suffering, and helplessness with its high contrast and newspaper-like graphic. Let me walk you through it. There's a large bull symbolizing fertility, virility, strength, and nationalism. In the upper left corner, standing above a woman who cries in anguish as she holds her dead child, a soldier lies dead on the ground, his body as broken as his sword. In the center, there's a horse pierced by a spike who begins to collapse, a large wound in his side. An electric light burns above its head. A woman leans out of a window, holding a lantern lit by a flame. Another woman, a distorted leg, gazes at the lantern as she lurches through a door. A third woman with her hands raised screams in horror as flames erupt around her. One is the flower growing near the soldier's hand. This flower represents hope. During his career, Picasso had oftentimes created paintings with a limited palette. In his early 20s, when he first moved to Paris from Spain, he used almost exclusively blue, thus his blue period a painful and traumatic time of great personal loss for young Picasso. Later, he switches to red and pink hues. I'll show you that. And life gets a little bit better for him during this time period. This monochromatic color scheme is purposeful and powerful. As he sketched Guernica, Picasso experimented with strategic use of colors. Let's see if I can go back, okay. For example, at one point, the wailing mother cried a blood red tear. In another place, he had his included scraps of wallpaper as he had done in his early collages. In the end, he did away with all of these colors. Here's a quote from Picasso about Guernica. The struggle, the Spanish struggle is the fight of reaction against the people and freedom. I clearly express my abhorrence of the military caste, which has sunk Spain in an ocean of pain and death. While Picasso was living in Nazi-occupied Paris during World War II, one German officer allegedly asked him upon seeing a photo of Guernica in his apartment as he was being questioned, did you do that? And Picasso responded, no, you did. The painting is currently located in the Queen Sophia Museum in Madrid, Spain. Picasso was adamant that Guernica remain at the Museum of Modern Art in New York until Spain reestablished a democratic republic. It would not be until after 1981, after both the artist and Franco's death, that the Spanish negotiators were finally able to bring this mural home. My last piece, you could probably guess, 
is by Jackson Pollock, who was a New York-based artist who painted this abstract masterpiece titled Convergence in 1952 at the height of his popularity. But it was quickly overshadowed by another painting he just finished titled Blue Poles. Let me show you that one. See, this one looks very similar, but it's different. You see the poles. This one became the most acclaimed painting of his short career. Between 1951 and 1953, Pollock shifted away from the colorful, impulsive, abstract drip paintings using oil-based house paint that made him famous. Action paintings changed art history. These large white canvases were stretched out, sometimes on the floor, and he splattered black paint, almost like cobwebs. His abstract expressionist style and his non-representational paintings, Pollock developed during his signature drip technique were symbols and gestures of a mind processing pain and fear. He was actually nicknamed Jack the Dripper. These were gestures of tension, beauty, distress in the art piece. And this is why it's so successful. Various colors adds confusion, frustration, even anger, as the layers literally compete for attention with the forgotten and unfinished unbelief underneath. Convergence was quietly purchased by the Albert Knox Art Gallery in Buffalo, New York in 1956, just five months before Pollock died in a drunk driving accident. He was married to fellow artist Lee Krasner, who created the Pollock Foundation. Well, thank you, Pflugerville Library, especially Ms. Bette McDowell for organizing this lecture. I will be hosting another one on July 2nd, and it's titled The American Flag in Contemporary Art. Thank you for your time and good night.